so welcome everyone. It's really nice to see you uh, here this morning. Uh, thank you for taking the time to come. Uh, so I will briefly introduce myself, uh, even though I think some of you already know me from the project or from the fact that I sent uh, the survey and asked you if you could answer it. And so my name is uh, Marie-Hélène Delove. I'm working at the Walloon Agricultural Research Center in Belgium uh, on the project Agroecology Transact. And so actually I will not be the first, the first uh, speaker because before we introduce you the program of today's webinar, we would just like to take a few minutes to explain you a little bit more about the project. So Adrien, if you're ready, you can um, introduce the project. Is it okay for you? Yes, thank you, marie okay. uh, You hear me well? Yes. Perfect. Perfect. Uh, yes, thank you, marie uh, So I, I will introduce you. Uh, I'm glad to introduce you the project Agroecology Transact as a whole, just to give you the, the broad picture, but I will, be, I will be brief, don't worry. Uh, so the project Agroecology Transact is a, a four-year project starting uh, in August 2022, and it's a Euro Horizon Europe project, so mainly um, founded by uh, Union European Union, sorry. So the big aim of agroecology transact is to foster the development of uh, agroecology. And to do so, um, there is a triple focus. So we try to, to give agroecology as an answer to three global issues, which are the uh, climate change adaptation and mitigation, the biodiversity conservation, and the socioeconomic resilience of the farms. You can click to the... Thank you. This um, triple focus here is... Uh, with a, a core group inside of the project. This core group is made of 11 Innovation Up. So that's the uh, yellow um, yellow point that you can see here on the map. And those uh, Innovation Up, which are initiatives, and we have uh, people here, uh, a lot of people here at the meeting from these initiatives, thank you to be there. Those are spread across uh, Europe, as you can see, uh, to have a, a diversity inside of Europe. You can click. And we try with those to make uh, what we call actionable knowledge. Uh, so meaning that we not we are not only in the, inside of the project to build science, but also to make it, to translate it into uh, action for all those uh, initiatives. And as you can see uh, here, we have we are in total 19 partners. So we don't have only innovation, but also other uh, scientists inside of the project. And we try to be in what we call a transdiscipl transdisciplinary approach. So that give also the name Transact. And this transdisciplinary approach means that we not only have people from agronomists, uh, 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 agronomical field, ecological uh, or animal sciences, but also people from economical, social or political uh, sciences that are pre present inside of the project. And I, I wanted also to highlight that uh, those uh, innovation of the 11, as you can see uh, here on your, on your screen, sorry, on the right hand side, uh, those are uh, coming from, these are building into different systems. So we have, for example, annual cropping, but also herbivore production system perennial cropping systems or integrated crop livestock systems, but also innovation apps that are more focused on larger scale, uh, working on uh, certification or on uh, box schemes to connect a city with uh, local production. So that was to give the, a broad picture. You can click to the next slide. And what I wanted also to highlight is here we are in a, a uh, one of the one of the idea of the project is to make scaling out, meaning that we don't not only have the innovation up, but also we try to go to uh, other initiatives, and so that's why Marilyn was building his uh, a survey, and we will come back to it later. But I, what I wanted to highlight is with the innovation up, or you maybe new in uh, initiatives coming inside of the project or collaborating with us. We are in a, 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 in a specific design where we not only want to use the in, in, initiatives, that's not what we want to do, but we want first to learn with them. So the idea to build with them new uh, scientific no knowledge, to engage with them. So meaning that uh, we want to build these uh, partnerships and collaboration with those uh, um, initiatives and also inspire. So trying to amplify the voices of uh, all people engaged of the engage in the project. So, so also the the in initiatives of the project. So it was really important for us to show you that uh, it's really not using the initiatives, but being with them, learning, engaging and inspiring. 
So that was to just to give a broad picture of the of the project. If you have more questions, uh, feel free to ask it after the presentations. And we even uh, are lucky to have uh, Bertrand Dumont, which is our coordinator of the project, who I'm sure could also uh, answer some question if you have. Uh, thank you, Marilyn. Thank you, Adrien. Uh, so now that we have introduced the project, we can move on to today's program. So we started on time at 10 a.m. and we are planning to finish at 12 a.m. 12 a.m. Sorry, CET. So for lunchtime, approximately, depending on what hour it is in your own country. And so during these two hours, we are planning firstly a small activity just to give you the, the opportunity to introduce yourselves. Uh, it will be like 10, 15 minutes long. Uh, then we will take some time for some presentations to show you the main results of the, of the survey. So the main results of our work. Then we will move on to a kind of networking activity. This means that it will be an opportunity for you to discuss freely. And so you will be split into breakout rooms uh, during 15 minutes. Then we will have a five minutes break. And after the break, uh, we will have the end of the networking activity, we will, which will be, sorry, the opportunity to share what has been discussed in the breakout rooms with the whole group in the main room. And then we will finish with a last topic, which is how you can benefit from agroecology transact, how you can get involved in the project. And of course, we will have a Q&A session and a conclusion and closure. Um, what is important here maybe is that uh, for the Q&A session, we will take all the questions that we will that will be asked during the webinar. So if you have questions, you can use the Q&A button or the chat if you don't find the Q&A button. Just ask your questions and then Anna will gather the different questions and we will try to answer to answer as many questions as possible by the end of the webinar. And you will also um, need the raise hand button for some of the activities uh, during this webinar. And uh, for the ones who just arrived, we have a student who is, who is translating the webinar from English to French. So if you wish, you can switch to French if this is more comfortable um, to you. So don't hesitate to, to do that also. This is more about logistics. Okay, so let's start with the first activity. So the opportunity to introduce yourselves. Um, the idea is that uh, when we analyze the results of the survey, we found out that you initiatives have a lot of different characteristics that emerged. And um, just to uh, give you the floor to talk, what we will do is that I will say uh, one of these characteristics out loud. And if your initiative is concerned, if that applies to your initiative, you can simply raise your hand. This is also an opportunity for us to know more about you, to get to know you. So a basic example, for example, if I was doing this uh, activity with shapes, if I said, raise your hand if you are a triangle, or triangle, just raise the hands. And then um, we will give the opportunity to one of you uh, for each question to just introduce his initiative uh, very, very briefly. Is it clear for everyone or is there any question at this point? Okay, so I think this is clear. Uh, Anna, maybe uh, as I'm sharing my screen, I cannot see the raised hands. So if you can just... Uh, as can suggest that probably the best is to stop sharing the screen now so that we can see everyone's faces. Ah, yes, of so course. People just raise their hands. I will do that. <laughs> okay. There we go. Okay, that's better. Uh, okay, so let's start with a first question. We would like to know if there are any initiatives who are not from um, a rural area. So are there any initiatives who are located in town or in a city for the main activities? Just gave a few seconds to raise their hands to see if anyone is concerned. Everybody's rural. Everybody's rural, yes. Okay, so that's clear. So we can ask another question. 
uh, we would like to know about uh, gender representation in your initiative. So could you please raise your hand if you think that there is a minority of women within your initiative? Or a majority of men, it also works uh, that way. <laughs> Lucas, Bertrand, everyone else seems to be majority women, that's cool. Okay. Um, maybe can could we ask to Luca van den Abel to introduce it himself? If that's okay for him. Yes, yeah, sure. Hi. Um, so I'm coordinating the a network, a serial network for a local brewery close to Brussels. Um, so it's not in Brussels; it's uh, still on the countryside. Um, and we uh, we supply the brewery with cereals, uh, ancient grains, um, um, partly. And so we have a network of like 10, 12 farmers. Uh, but yeah, most of the farmers are men. Uh, there's a couple of women involved, but uh, really not so many. And also in the in the brewery itself, yeah, it's mainly men. Uh, I'm coordinating the whole, so it's uh, yeah, kind of a man. Uh, dominated uh, project but it's 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 not the, the aim of course but it's it's it kind of uh, goes that way okay thank you very much uh, you will see that we have some uh, interesting results about uh, gender representation <laughs> okay, i hope it will be interesting for you and i can see that costin also raised his hand maybe costin you want to introduce yourself yes uh, i am facilitator of the eha bio danubius uh, which is uh, very close to the area of the uh, Danube Delta uh, reservation. So uh, we are um, concentrating our efforts on uh, farmers and processors, but also on uh, inputs, uh, um, inputs um, for, for organic agriculture. Our profile is organic, uh, mainly. And um, that's uh, how we are concerned how to introduce uh, the concept of going beyond organic uh, using agroecological practices. And uh, from the gender uh, lenses, we, uh, we uh, have more farmers. Uh, of course, uh, I, don't, uh, can, I cannot measure the input of women, uh, but uh, since they are farmers, uh, they are also working in families. So women are involved to some extent, but uh, at least uh, at the level of uh, decision makers and uh, people which we are interacting, they are mostly uh, men. Okay, thank you very much. So for both of you, it's more like in the representation of uh, women uh, among the farmers, um, which exactly. is, it is the case. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. So I think we can move on to another characteristic. Um, so I would like to know if uh, some initiatives are certified, any kind of certification. Uh, Kostin already spoke about organic, but there are other certifications. Just feel free to raise your hand if you are certified. Okay. Lucas, you're so winning this. Yeah. <laughs> yes, we have a winner. <laughs> and I can also see that Anna Zumelda, I'm sorry for the names, I hope I'm, I'm pronouncing correctly. Uh, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, thank you. Um, well, I'm representing Stanisław Karłowski Foundation. It is situated in the northwest of Poland and it runs a huge uh, biodynamic farm. I would really call it huge because it's almost 2,000 hectares. Uh, so even under our regional conditions, which already are large scale, we are even a little bit bigger <laughs> than most of the big farms. Uh, and we are certified organic and also biodynamic. Okay, thanks. And do you think that you could be eligible to other kind of certifications that you don't have, or not necessarily? Um, well, at this point of time, I think the certifications we have 
uh, it's difficult to get beyond that because, well, we have the organic certificate and we have the biodynamic certificate, uh, both for uh, plant production and for animal husbandry. Um, and what I am not sure about, because this is something we are discussing among Polish colleagues at this moment, so I don't want to tell something wrong. Uh, there are some agroecological measures uh, farmers can take up, but it seems that organic farmers are excluded from this funding. I'm not sure if this is really true, but if it is true, of course, it's very Bad because um, well, organic farmers usually are those who are rather willing to take up uh, some novelty solutions. Uh, and we have in our Polish uh, uh, strategic plan uh, measures like uh, afforestation, introducing trees and hedges and so on but organic seems to be excluded from this funding. But please put a question mark behind that because at this point of time, we are not sure if this is really true. So this is something I would say, it would be great to have this if we could have this in addition, but we don't have it at this, uh, well, we don't have it at this point of time. Okay, thank you very much for sharing uh, your experience. And I also see that Costin and Luca have uh, hands raised. Uh, you already introduced yourself, but of course, if you want to add something about certification, just feel free to to, to talk. In myself, I would add uh, only that uh, some of the farmers uh, they are um, uh, they they are participating in. Um, voluntary certification uh, schemes uh, which are uh, private uh, certifications uh, we are also intending to develop such a scheme uh, we are in the process of um, um, let's say considering different different options uh, but i don't know where this uh, it's we can call it a certification uh, but uh, it's uh, it's a private uh, voluntary standard Okay, thanks. And uh, Luca, I saw that you unmuted yourself. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I would like to um, to add maybe two things. So I didn't tell. So we are also certified organic. Um, but actually, in the beginning of the project, six years ago, uh, we really wanted to involve um, or to invite conventional farmers to join the initiative. And so what the model we proposed them was to um, to join the project, to join the network of farmers, uh, to grow cereals for the brewery on their own field, so on conventional uh, on a conventional farm, but to grow it with the organic principles. So without adding any uh, chemical fertilizers, pesticides, uh, and so on. And so with the help of the other real organic farmers, so to say, uh, and having a lot of knowledge exchange and field visits. And so they really could, uh, with, this, um, with this approach, kind of um, experience what would be organic farming on their farm uh, and also being sure that the cereals afterwards could be bought by the brewery uh, for a fair price. And so um, so we invited them to, to do some trials, actually. We also told them that in the end, it was the aim to certify the brewery organic. And once that was the case, uh, we couldn't have this flexibility of working with this kind of... Uh, conventional farms um, and so we did in in the end uh, and so some of these farms converted to organic or are in the process of um, transformation but uh, some others said okay we uh, we were very happy with this project we were very happy to test uh, organic cereal growth within our farms but we are not ready yet to uh, to convert the whole farm uh, and the other crops to uh, to organic. So that was actually a really uh, a nice opportunity for them also to get to know the organic farmers, to get to know uh, what means organic farmers farming, um, to experience also the the different machines they could sometimes use from the other farms, and to really set up a, a, a whole dynamics of uh, of exchange between the conventional and the 
and the organic farms. And then maybe a second thing um, is that in Belgium, at least, there's this um, certificate for, uh, it's called in French, prix juste producteur. So it's a uh, fair pricing for the producers. Um, which we haven't uh, got yet, um, but we're thinking of it because we really developed a whole pricing model um, where we, we share the risk with the farmers. And so we have partly a price per hectare, partly a price per ton. And so the price per hectare, even if the crop goes bad because, uh, because of the climate, um, the farmer still gets paid. Um, because we think that he is doing so much on his on his land. It's not his fault that it's raining on, on, on the bad moment, for example. Um, and so we really developed this whole um, this whole model together uh, in a participatory way together with the farmers. And we tried it now for like four years uh, and it's really working uh, very well. The farmers are very satisfied because in, we had some bad years actually. Um, and they were paid uh, quite well. So this is something we are thinking of. On the other side, we're a bit afraid with the brewery to add too many labels to the beer, uh, which might also complexify for the for the consumer. So that's why we didn't really uh, add this uh, this price label on top. But uh, but we're working on it. Okay, thanks. That is really interesting. And uh, I'm taking this opportunity because I see that you already uh, share a lot of experience and that's really nice. So also, if you have questions not for us, but for the other initiatives about their own experience, just feel free to ask them in the chat. And I think it's also a good door uh, to open now uh, to allow further communication after the webinar. And... Um, I think there are two participants uh, who couldn't introduce themselves yet. Uh, Viara Stefanova and also, no, I think that's it. Yeah, maybe Viara, you would like to introduce yourself before we stop the activity. And do you hear me like this or not? Yeah. Okay. So I'm uh, from Bulgaria. Uh, we are the innovation hub of Bulgaria, and uh, we are focused on the high nature value farmland, uh, working with farmers and uh, trying to to continue this kind of farming in Western Sahara Plain. So this is what I can say. Okay, thank you. Be short because time is running. <laughs> Oh, no, it's okay. We still have two minutes <laughs> if you want to add something. No, thank you. No? Okay, I think we can um, do the... I think we can move on to the next activity. That's okay for everyone. I can see that uh, two participants from initiatives... Ah, yes, there is Michael Michael Lobman, but I think there is an issue with the audio. I'm not sure. I don't know if Michael, Michael, sorry, I don't know, <laughs> wants to uh, introduce himself. Sorry, I just came back because I was uh, thrown out of the meeting. Uh, um, no problem. Where did we stop? Just a normal introduction or? <laughs> yes, so I'm uh, representing Svensk Kohlenlagering. That's a Swedish initiative. Uh, we work with uh, yeah, regenerative farming and soil carbon credits, but our actual mission is to promote an agroecological transition of the Swedish food system. So we work mostly with the farmers in terms of uh, exchanging between them, but also uh, educating them. So we have an online course that is for free, for example. We do advisory and we also compensate them for their efforts to transition. But on the other hand, we also uh, try to, for example, promote uh, yeah, the content between, for example, retailers or the industry, food industry, and the marketing chains. Like, how can, for example, uh, retailers help producers to produce more sustainably in terms of uh, marketing concepts? Yep. So that's uh, our main work. Yeah. So we, okay. Yep. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. So I think uh, now you all introduce yourselves, at least people from the initiatives. So I think we can. Uh, move on to the next uh, step of the webinar. So I will share my screen again. I'm sorry, we won't see your faces anymore, or oh, not a lot. Um, up. Yeah, I think you can all see my screen. Just uh, 
just tell me if it's not the case. <laughs> yeah. Okay, perfect. Uh, so as I explained, now we will move on to some uh, presentations uh, because when we um, sent you the invitation and when you registered, we asked you what you were interested in uh, for this webinar. And a lot of you told us that they would be interested in getting to know a little bit more about the results of the survey and more specifically about the diversity of initiatives that answered the survey and uh, about the factors of success and failure, which are, um, I would say, conditions that are positive or negative for the development of agroecological initiatives like yours. And so, as you know, we used an online survey to collect information about your initiatives in Europe. And when we stopped the survey in January 2024, so a few months ago, we had eight, 89 answers from 23 different countries. So these are countries from the European Union, Switzerland, the United Kingdom, and, and also one answer from Serbia. So I do believe that we have quite a good geographical spread uh, of the uh, answers that we received. And uh, I'm taking this opportunity also to thank you again for taking part and for taking the time to, 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 fill, the to fill the survey. That is uh, really, really valuable. And uh, you can also see that we had answers from two initiatives um, in the overseas territories, as we call them. So from Guyana and uh, Guadeloupe. So basically, this is the map of the answers that we received. Um, as you know, in reality, uh, things are complex and all initiatives are different. You all have your own characteristics. You all, you are all embedded in your own context that tends to influence you. And so one of our goal here at Agroecology Transact with this survey was to try to understand uh, this complexity organize this complexity and this diversity and try to describe it. So to do so, we chose the path of developing a typology, which means that we would like to highlight different types of initiatives that exist in our sample and assign the different uh, initiatives to these types, which we also call clusters. So basically, to explain the, the process, again, if we were working with little shapes of colors and if we wanted to sort them into types, into clusters, we could use different characteristics, some of them that can, that can be obvious characteristics. For example, we could decide to sort the shapes just based on the color. And we, we, we would end up, for example, with four different clusters of shapes that look alike. Or we could choose another criteria, for example, the shape itself. Do we have shapes with straight lines only, shapes with round lines only, or shapes with a mix of both? So this is a basic um, example just to show you that we could use one point of view that is obvious. Or we could also ask ourselves the question, are there combination of characteristics of the initiatives, in this case of the shapes, that we could use to describe this complexity, to describe this diversity, and that we do not um, see at first sight something that is not uh, that obvious at the beginning. So what we did is we used statistical tools on the results of the survey to try to develop a typology uh, that will give some that gives something maybe totally different from what we would have uh, had if we had used obvious criteria to develop this typology. So uh, from the first results that we have from the survey, we have highlighted some criteria that we will use to um, develop this, typ this typology, this clustering of initiatives. So I will just show you the criteria that we will use, but not the typology itself, because it still needs further analysis and the results are not totally ready. And also, I would like to highlight the fact that, of course, the results that I will show you are really linked to what we have asked in the survey. It's not an absolute truth uh, of what exists in Europe, of what exists in our sample. It is uh, results based on the questions asked in the survey and based on the outputs of some statistical analysis. But this can give already uh, an idea of what uh, we will have in the end. 
So a first criteria that is important to describe the diversity of the initiatives who answered the survey is the main agricultural production within the initiative, because we, we could really see a difference between some initiatives who are not involved at all in agricultural production, so they have no agricultural production at all, and initiatives who are focused on uh, cereal crop production and initiatives who are focused on vegetable production. So this is really an important criteria for the typology. A second criteria is the main market channel that is used. There is also really a difference between uh, the initiatives who are selling directly to consumers or using short market channels with a really a low number of intermediaries and initiatives will mainly use long and more classical market channels with a lot of intermediaries. A third criteria is the dependence on external suppliers for inputs, uh, in the sense that most of the initiatives who are having agricultural production depend on external suppliers for some of their inputs, but what changes from one initiative to another and from one type to another is uh, the input for which the initiative is dependent on external suppliers. And this is also very linked to the type of agricultural production, of course. Um, another criteria is the number of farms within the initiative, because uh, you could already see it from some of the testimonies here uh, of the uh, initiative who are attending this webinar, but we really have initiative who are simply, I would say, single farms with agricultural production. But we also have initiatives which are like big organizations, big gatherings of farms, up to 3,000 farms who uh, work together or who at least are involved in the initiative in a way or another. A fifth criteria is the scale of action, because we have initiatives who are really active at the field level. This is the case, for example, for some field trials, which can be done by researchers. We have initiatives who are active at the farm level and initiatives active, active at the food system level. For example, initiatives who implement alter, alternative food systems, sorry, in a city uh, uh, yes, uh, applying an alternative food system in a city. Another criteria is the main source of funding. Uh, we could really see the difference between initiatives who are um, mainly using their own private money to fund their activities, so they are more independent, I would say, from initiatives who really depend on subsidies or public funds. And another criteria which is linked to that is the diversity of sources of funding. Some initiatives just use one source of funding and uh, some have really the opportunity to diversify uh, these sources of funding to launch their activity or to develop their activities. Uh, another criteria that emerged as being relevant is the level of education of farmers in the sense that uh, there are really uh, some types of initiatives where the um, farmers with a high level of education prevail. And when I say high level of education, this is based on an international um, classification system of education levels. So we are talking about tertiary education after um, secondary school, university and uh, PhDs. And a uh, last criteria that we will take into account for the typology is the formality of governance of decision-making processes. Again, we have a set of initiatives who are really using informal decision-making processes, informal management, and others who are much more formal in the way uh, they take decisions and the way they work. So this is what will be used for the typology, which unfortunately I cannot share today, but you will see later in this webinar that you will have the opportunity to access uh, these results uh, later on. And uh, then the second topic that was explored through our survey and that we tried to analyze are the factors of influence. And what we mean by factors of influence is um, factors that influence your development positively or negatively. 
So this can be characteristics of your initiative itself. For example, if you have uh, researchers involved in your initiative, this can be seen as positive or negative for its development. It depends on what you, how you feel. And we also have factors which are linked to the context. So these are factors you don't really have an influence on. You cannot really control, you cannot really change. This can be, for example, climatic conditions like temperature, precipitation, or extreme weather events that occur and that can influence you positively and negatively. Sometimes in a very surprising way, uh, we could see that in the results. And so I will just show you uh, the, the results. So a list of factors of failure and factors of success. This is really based on what you answered. So this is just a kind of restitution of, uh, the, um, of the main trends of the answers that you gave, um, which reflect your feelings, I would say, the way you feel it influences you. And so we could see from the outputs of the survey that Generally, being far from cities or being far from markets, for markets, sorry, was something uh, that is seen as being quite detrimental. Also, this seems obvious, but of course, a lack of workforce within the initiative to do the job is something that is kind of blocking your development. There is also an issue about the availability of land. When there is a decrease of the availability of land, this is something that is detrimental to your development. It is also the case for the availability of fresh, wa of fresh water resources, although this really depends on the type of agricultural production that you have. There is a uh, differentiated sensitivity to, to this factor. Also, uh, the decrease in precipitation amount, increase of temperature, and increase of the, frequency of the frequency of extreme weather events, which are all linked to climate and uh, maybe to climate change also. And so for the factors of success, so the things that you reported as being quite positive for your development, we have, of course, the fact of being uh, close to cities or close to markets, which is something positive. Also, the use of direct and short market channels instead of long market channels was seen as more positive. Um, and of course, having enough workforce to do the job in the initiative, again, that seems uh, quite obvious. Uh, we were talking about gender representation in the introduction uh, during the icebreaker. And uh, what emerged from the results is that you consider you, you seem to consider that having equality in the representation of men and women within uh, the initiative is something that is quite uh, positive for your development. And also uh, when farmers which are involved in your initiative have, have a high level of education, so university, PhD or tertiary education, uh, you seem to think that this is something that is positive for the development of uh, your activities. And of course, uh, when you have more land available and when you have more fresh water resources available, this is something that also um, emerged as being positive for your development. So now I showed you some results about the typology, or at least the criteria that will be used and taken into account for the typology, and uh, some results about the factors of success and failure. But as it is now, it is not really such a valuable result. And what we would like to do in the next step is really to link both results, to try to see if there are any specific conditions where certain types of initiatives are more likely to develop and uh, the other way around for the different types of initiatives that exist, what can be the good conditions um, for their development. And so to do so, we will of course use the, the results of the survey that I just show you and that needs to be pushed a little bit further. But also we will use results from, um, the, from the interviews that we will um, do with some of you and that already started. So the idea is really that, okay, a survey is interesting to have some results, to have some data and information, but we cannot really go deep into what you think, uh, what you mean, and there are some results that we don't really understand. 
and um, the interviews, which will be qualitative, which will allow to go deeper, are really useful uh, for that purpose because it will give us additional information. It will allow us to go further, to have a proper analysis of this link between the different types of initiatives and the factors of success and failure. And if I can give you a concrete example, for example, uh, I just showed you that um, the increase of extreme weather events, so the fact of having more fires, more extreme temperatures, more floods, and this type of stuff, uh, is something that is negative. And this seems obvious to a lot of us, but quite a lot of initiatives also reported that this was positive. And we are wondering why and how extreme temperatures and extreme weather can be beneficial to some initiatives. And for that purpose, for example, the interviews will be um, really useful. But uh, I'm not the one who will lead these interviews. My colleague, Adrien, uh, who already introduced the project at the beginning of the webinar, will be leading that. So Adrien, if you're ready, if you can just explain a little bit more about the interviews. Yes, exactly. And you can click on the next slide. Thank you, Marie-Hélène. Uh, so as Marie-Hélène mentioned, we will try to go uh, a bit a step further with some uh, initiatives. And the idea is to make uh, some interviews with uh, two or three key actors of those uh, initiatives. Um, you can click. Exactly. Why do we want to, to make those? But as Marie-Hélène already mentioned, we want to gain a better understanding. So link with typology, link with uh, um, uh, factors of success and failures. And what we want to, or what I want to have in uh, as focus inside of those uh, interviews is First, to talk about those factor, factors of success and failures, to have a better understanding of them, but also talked about the actors that are present in the initiatives and the relationship that we can find between those uh, actors. Now, how? Well, those will be uh, interview conducted with two or three actors. We can, of course, discuss that as there is a, a very different type of uh, initiatives here. Those will be for obvious uh, organizational and environmental reasons reason uh, mainly made online, but there is also the possibility to come in person if uh, people are not comfortable uh, with it. Uh, some key actors of the of the initiatives, for example, uh, is it is it it is sorry also possible. And when will be those uh, interviews? Well, we are quite flexible between now and June. And the idea is that each interview will last between one uh, to uh, two hours. So really, the, the idea is that it doesn't take too much of your time, as we know that a lot of initiatives have a, a lot of requests and a lot of things to do. Uh, so it can really be, uh, uh, for example, two actors, one to two hours online, and uh, we hope that it doesn't take uh, too much time. Uh, uh, or we can come on site and take a bit more time. It's quite uh, uh, flexible. You can click. And so if you are interested, well, uh, here is my e email. The idea uh, in this uh, scaling out uh, process is that we had the uh, um, the uh, survey from Marie-Hélène, which was quite broad and which uh, uh, had a bit less than 100 answers. Here we will be a bit more focused on around 10 initiatives. So we can't do it with all the initiatives that answered the survey, but we'll try to do, as I mentioned, around 10 initiatives. There are already some of you that answer me because I contact them directly directly because they were interesting in our typology to have them for the, this interview. So thank you to Lucas, where I already made the interview, and thank you to Anna, who already uh, 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 answered me to make those. Um, uh, but so we are still open to find a new of them. So feel free to contact me by uh, this email if you are interested in these, uh, in these uh, uh, interviews, or you can send a message here in the in the chat if you want, so I can contact. And if you contact me, uh, don't be afraid just also to explain it a, a, little bit, a little bit further. And you can, when I explain it a little bit, uh, or, or, always say no uh, to my request, so uh, uh, no worry. Mm -hmm. You can click on the next slide. Just to mention, uh, as a result of example, as I mentioned in the introduction, we don't not uh, we do not want only 
use what you are doing. We want to build that together. Uh, so the idea is that it's also benefits to your initiatives, what we are doing inside of those interviews. Here is an example of uh, 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 interviews that were conducted inside of the project with Innovation Hub. And it's an example uh, made by um, results made by uh, Anina Fry and uh, Pauline Kassar, colleagues of me in the project. And you can see here an example of the Danish Innovation Hub where we build uh, things to this interview on actors and their relationships, a map of their actors to give an original view on their map. So we, we can see here each node as, a, as an actor and where are the relationships and where are the key actors and so on. Then you can click on the next example. And uh, uh, here is another example of another map of factors of success and failures, again, built with uh, interviews. And you can see uh, uh, here nodes. I'm not going to jump into details, but just to, to show an example of nodes where we can see there are some, uh, or she called barriers and levers to the initiatives. And so those two examples was here really to open a discussion with these initiatives and to give them a, an original view to think about their future and how they can uh, make the next steps uh, in their transition. So that was just to, to give an, an example of this interview. I, I repeated, if you're interested, here is my email address or feel free to contact me in, uh, in the chat box. Thank you. Thank you, Adrien. Um, okay, I think we can also send the email address of Adrien in the chat. So if anyone wants to copy it and send an email later on, it, will, it might be easier. Um, okay, and uh, now for the results also, I would like to share uh, two information with you. The first one is that Okay, I already showed you some results, but we don't have a lot of time. We cannot dip. Uh, we cannot go deep into the details and maybe some results are more interesting for you than others. So what we decided to do is to develop an interactive online dashboard. So this is basically a website where you can explore the results, the data uh, that interests you the most. This is something that is still under development. There are already some results available, but not all of all of them. And so we would be very, very interested to have your feedbacks and to have also your comments to know what will be useful for you, what will be valuable. So if you want to go and explore it, you can already scan the QR code, but I will also take a few minutes to show you what it looks like. And a second information that you might fi find interesting is that the data set itself, which is linked to the results of the survey, is available on Zenodo, so publicly available. This means that you can go on the website and download an Excel file with all the answers, which of course have been anonymized, as this was announced uh, before you filled the survey. And you will also have, in addition to the data set, some documents that explain how we collected the data, uh, that describe the data. And so this means that the, this data can, can be uh, used and explored um, publicly. So I will just change my screen to show you this online dashboard. Again, tell me if you can see it, but I think you can see it. Uh, this is yeah. basically the dashboard. You have here a welcome page, welcome on our dashboard. And you have uh, here different topics that are covered. For example, uh, we have included the map of the initiatives. You can see all the answers that we received. And you also have the possibility to filter the results um, based on what interests you the most. For example, if I only want results from France, I can just see the initiatives from France. And below the map, I will have some data tables for now, but of course we will add other inputs to describe these initiatives in France, and you will have the main trends of the initiatives that answered. Um, we also talked about factors of influence. So this is also something that you can explore by yourself on this dashboard if you want more details. Um, for example, we talked about the distance of the initiative from cities. We said that the closer um, an, an initiative is to a city, the more positive it is. Uh, this is something that you can see here in the results. You can have the detail or you can explore any other um, 
factor of success and failure if you want to see the details of the, of the results of the survey. Uh, we will also add the clustering results because I talked to you about the typology that is not finished yet. The work is in progress, so it will be added to the dashboard as soon as it is ready. And you also have here the link to download the data um, on Zenodo. So this is basically what it looks like. You will have uh, some documents, but also the Excel file itself. Here are all the documents that can be downloaded. So really feel free to explore the dashboard, the data sets and the documents if you want to have more details and more results. So I can come back to my presentation now. Yeah, and actually I will just stop talking uh, for a bit because now I suggest that we start the networking activity. We called it a networking activity, but the idea is to um, is that you will be splitted in breakout rooms, or at least you will join a small group in a breakout room. So um, the breakout rooms are only dedicated to the initiatives, not to the scientists who are attending the, the webinar, because this is really a space for them to discuss together about their experiences uh, freely during 15 minutes. Uh, we are suggesting a topic for discussion, which is which results of the survey are the most interesting for you? or which results do you relate to, why, and how can we make these results actionable? Of course, this is a topic for discussion, but also feel free to exchange freely during these 15 minutes about topics that interest you and which are linked to the results of the survey. Uh, take time to explain what your initiative is doing, ask questions to each other or whatever. This is mainly an opportunity for you to speak together and to network. So this activity will be 15 minutes long. We will also ask you to choose someone uh, for the restitution after the activity. So once the activity is finished, we will have a five minute break. And then we will all come back to the main room uh, where you can explain us what you have been discussing. And uh, we can continue to discuss all together about uh, this topic. Okay, so let's restart. Uh, we had two breakout rooms uh, for this exercise. A first breakout room with Bertrand and Luca, and the other breakout room with Anna, Costine, and Mikael, I think. Uh, yeah, and the last breakout room with Shima and Darlene, but I'm not sure they discussed the topic, so let's see. Uh, does anyone want to? to share what has been said. <laughs> I can start. We uh, didn't really answer the question properly, I think, um, but we exchanged, <laughs> which was very interesting. Um, and so uh, a couple of the topics which came up uh, was uh, in both of our initiatives uh, where we are working with farmers is that actually coordination of the whole project is a, is an, an issue, uh, especially uh, paying the coordinator. So who is funding uh, the whole coordination? Uh, and so it's partly uh, in France uh, with the project of um, Bertrand, it's uh, partly research uh, fundings. Uh, so research stations uh, organizing it. In my case, uh, it's actually the brewery, brewery uh, paying me, so I'm employed uh, by the brewery, so the transformator. Um, but um, yeah, in both cases, it's not a real long-term uh, way of, 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 of organizing uh, the project. And so we really question how, um, how for other projects in other situations, how can we really uh, make a sustainable uh, way of coordination in the long run, because it's projects with farmers and they not, don't work on two or three year basis projects. We really need um, a long distance uh, approach. So that's one of the real big questions, um, which we didn't resolve yet. 
Um, and then the other uh, topic was the fact that uh, we sometimes lack involvement of the farmers. So once a, a certain project is set up, the farmers uh, feel confident in uh, in a project, but they might not take a lot of initiative of uh, taking the project further, um, which was our case, uh, for example, searching for new breweries or mills or bakers kind of to try to enlar enlarge in this, uh, this network. Um, we tried, but the farmers uh, yeah, didn't take a lot of initiatives. And we heard a bit the same story in France, that the farmers are not really um, taking it further um, and lacking, yeah, lacking kind of initiatives. You want to add anything to that, Bertrand? No, that was very, very clear. So uh, just to, for clarity, uh, I talked for Coccinelli Innovation Lab not as the coordinator of agroecology transact and for uh, Michael and Anna Coxinelli is a project we have in central massive central where we think on the future of dairy systems in this grassland based area and we had a lot of discussion about uh, the future of calves and especially of male calves because uh, if you are interested in uh, dairy production, you know that calves are byproducts, and uh, there are many societal concerns about how to uh, raise these calves so that their life, even if it's short, uh, is uh, acceptable for, for society. And uh, the third idea that came out from this discussion is also the, the, the price of the agroecological products that we are producing, because I think that, that I understand from Luca that uh, uh, in their initiative, they wanted to give a fair price to the, to the uh, farmers. And in our case, uh, price is also a source of concern because we have this in mind. And also uh, the point is that if you leave a, a calf with his mother, the calf will drink a lot of milk. And this is milk that is, will not be sold by the farmers. And so doing this, we are promoting a system where we will uh, make a very expensive calves to be produced. It's better for their welfare, but this has a cost because the farmer do not sell, sell less milk. And for instance, in the area where we are, we are in a PDO cheese production and people, when they transform milk into cheese, they make money from this. And this can be seen as a blocker for them to accept the, the system, they are happy with the, the good image of their farm where calves stay with their dam, but uh, they are not that happy with the fact that the calves drink a lot of milk. So it's clearly a barrier. So, and in the case of Luca, uh, they also promoted a system where uh, agriculture uh, farmers receive a fair price for their product. And this did not help securing the, the system. This made some people reluctant to join the group especially those who are involved in uh, product transformation. So this was uh, an interesting point, but starting from two highly contrasting systems, uh, we, we found some things in common. And the discussion was really interesting. And so that's why we probably missed the target of the question we were asked, but it was interesting anyway. <laughs> okay, thank you. But the most important thing is that it is interesting for you anyway. And uh, also from what you said, we can relate to our own results, or at least it already gives more information and it shows how how important the interviews are to understand the results of the survey, because you also talked about funding and about the price for consumers. So this is also really interesting for us. So thank you. For, thank you for that. Um, and so for the other breakout room, is there anyone who wants to talk and to share experience? Or I can pick someone. <laughs> Christine, I can see that, that you are unmuted. Do you want to talk? No, no, I'm not uh, muted. I just, uh, but uh, I wanted uh, maybe perhaps Anna because uh, I thought uh, Anna will uh, will speak. But uh, let me speak. Uh, just uh, we uh, spoke very much on uh, the carbon credit markets, and we reached uh, the uh, our topic, uh, and our questions um, indirectly because uh, we were uh, looking, uh, investigating how. Uh, uh, how you can uh, make um, 
more attractive for farmers, uh, this uh, carbon retention. And uh, that was a very interesting subject to be to be discussed. And uh, then uh, uh, besides carbon credit market, uh, our conclusion is that uh, uh, all these um, credits uh, are not uh, first interest for at least for organic farmers, but uh, more interested they may be if uh, this uh, they will be increasing of sales. By the end of the day, they want more sales to be recognized uh, in sales their endeavors that's all from yes, my side if if i may add something to this uh, i can confirm it very much uh, well from my polish experience uh, farmers are ready to take up uh, eco ecological measures but they are um, but they are tired of applying for funding and for additional funding and for another funding. And it would probably, it will make life easier for them if they can, if, if, if those uh, agroecological measures will be visible uh, via a brand or a certificate we don't have so far. Uh, and they can sell their products at a higher price um, because this is also part of their self-conception. They rather want to sell, produce and sell their products. Uh, they are less willing to keep themselves busy with, uh, with, well, with administration and applications. Okay, thank you. That's also interesting to see that there are some kind of commonalities with the other breakout room when you talk about topics linked to the to the price involvement of farmers and funding issues. So again, um, I think uh, these exchanges are interesting for you. They are so interesting for us. So I hope we will have the opportunity to go deeper into that. Um, so thank you very much for uh, taking um, the job seriously, I would say, <laughs> with the discussions. And um, now I will, I will share my screen again uh, to suggest you something. Um, Okay, so okay, so now uh, you just took the time to uh... I think we we've lost Marie Helen. We'll try to uh... we have, but not to fear people because we have a very clear plan of how we move forward. Give it just a wee second to see if she comes back, and otherwise, we can probably move ahead if that's okay. Yeah, yes, of course. No, I think the let's wait two minutes if she can come back, otherwise, we'll uh, we'll go on. I already prepared the slide, the slides if needed. I think I see signs of life there. Maybe not. We'll give her a wee second just in case she's reconnecting, but if she can, we can probably move forward with Cecilia and Marius, if that's the case. You ready, both of you, Cecilia and Marius, just in case you need to sort of like have your moment to shine without marie Lens guidance? Yes, I'm ready. <laughs> Love to hear that. You both look very, very ready. I think that's okay. We can probably go ahead with that. And uh, I see that Adrien is sort of like sourcing the situation internally on the other side. So if you feel comfortable, I think that the next step was actually talking a little bit about what you guys are doing. So if you could introduce a little bit what you're doing in my
project and my program for the day was first Cecilia and then Marius. So Cecilia, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I prepared some slides to explain a little bit uh, what I wanted to share. So I'll, I'll share my screen. Yeah, and what I wanted to, to do, what was part of the program is to basically take five quick minutes uh, to share a little bit what we're doing in the Agroecology Transect project with regards to the this multi-criteria evaluation of agroecological systems. And I've identified three different types of output that should come out of this work, which I think would present interesting opportunities for exchange between the project and this wider network of initiatives. So I thought I would start a little bit with this figure that I've put here as a bit of an example of a multi-criteria analysis. So this figure was taken from this paper, which presented a synthesis on the performance of organic systems in comparison to conventional systems. And what we can see is that organic agriculture overperforms on a number of criteria, for example, species richness. These are the petals that go beyond this red circle. But we can also see that organic agriculture underperforms on some other criteria, for example, this brown petal uh, looking at yields. We can also see some gray petals, and these are areas where we really don't have enough data uh, to be able to make this comparison. And these often relate to more socioeconomic criteria. So what we're going to do in this project is essentially undertake a similar multi-criteria analysis, but we're going to go, of course, beyond organic agriculture to look at agroecology. And we all know that agroecology is a more holistic concept. It's a science, it's a practice, it's a social movement. Uh, when we think about practices, these are much more varied. Um, they're oriented around certain principles, uh, most importantly, the principle looking at the reuse of local inputs, but also uh, on principles looking at working with nature, so enhancing biodiversity. And because uh, agroecology is more holistic, it ranges from the field scale to the food system scale. It's also being presented uh, as a solution to a number of global challenges that we're facing, uh, ranging from climate change to biodiversity loss, and also um, kind of the unfair distribution of power within uh, value chains related to agricultural systems. However, agroecology also lacks uh, institutional support, as we've discussed a little bit already today. So this was what kind of one of the starting points for this work in this project was to kind of build a broad evidence base on what are the benefits of agroecology? What are some of these criteria on which agroecology is overperforming in comparison to conventional systems? Uh, however, because agroecology is also so diverse and holistic and integrative, what we really need are tailored solutions. We need to identify what works in specific contexts. And so this is what our project is trying to do. We have this very diverse uh, set of practitioners and scientists in our consortium. We have these 11 innovation hubs. And these vary in terms of a number of, of characteristics. They represent different bioclimatic zones. They also represent different agri agricultural systems and are experimenting with different uh, agroecological practices. And so by undertaking monitoring and evaluation in each of these 11 innovation hubs, what we hope to do is to start building this broad evidence base uh, on the impacts of agroecology, and we can start building uh, these contextualized solutions. So in terms of what could be three different opportunities for exchange, um, the first one I've identified is that we would be happy to share and exchange ideas on essentially the methodology that we've developed for creating this multi-criteria analysis framework. And the framework consists of three different parts. It begins with a definition of relevant indicators and metrics uh, on which we can identify impacts. The second step, and this is what we're currently devising, is the data collection and analysis. And we also have a third step, which should aim to provide guidelines on how can we really make these results actionable? How can we make use of these results, basically? And I've also heard that some of your other initiatives are also implementing these participatory approaches. And so this was very much also uh, the, the methodology that we followed for devising this framework. We, we implemented this knowledge co-production approach, uh, which is centered around this deliberate collaboration between science and society. And so what we can do is, or what we're doing with uh, also uh, some colleagues that are social scientists, is identifying principles to navigate essentially this knowledge co-production process. And so this is something that we can exchange. I've kind of identified this as a sort of meta framework. We can think about it along those terms. Um, a second opportunity for connection, and this relates to whether you're interested in undertaking also data collection in your own in, in your own uh, initiatives, is of course to share details on the specific contents of our framework. So we would be happy to exchange ideas on the specific indicators and metrics that we've identified. 
Uh, these range from looking at the evaluation of biodiversity, but also carbon storage and more socioeconomic indicators. We would also be happy to share uh, our insights and materials around data collection and analysis. So we've devised specific farm surveys, uh, but also field measurement protocols. Marius, uh, in a minute, will also share a little bit about one of these. And we're also building training materials to facilitate data collection and, of course, analytical tools. So these are all things that we would be happy to share and also receive feedback on. And regarding to the last step, uh, we have a wealth of experience in our, in our network of innovation hubs on how to make use of results from field trials and from this monitoring. And these results have been used for outreach to other farmers to get them to adopt agroecological practices, but they can also be used for advocacy purposes, for example. And so we would like to pull together these experiences and also see if we can identify some guidelines on how can you best make use of results for monitoring and evaluation. Um, and then in terms of kind of the last opportunity that I've identified where we could exchange on, of course, there's probably more, but this relates to specifically the results of the multi-criteria analysis framework. So perhaps you're interested in learning on the outcomes from what was the knowledge that we've identified from all of these uh, 11 different innovation hubs? Do we see trends in the performance of agroecology? Or perhaps you're interested in learning about the performance of a particular set of agroecological practices or specific countries or contexts. So these are all things that we could share our insights on. And we could do this in the future through, through other webinars such as this one, but uh, also in some innovation hubs, uh, there's likely gonna be some live events to showcase some of these results, for example, through demonstration days. So you can also perhaps think of attending some of these restitution um, events in person if they happen to take place close to your initiatives as well. So that's a little bit the this short overview of what we're doing with regards to this work. And I just wanted to end by saying that we, we greatly value this opportunities for exchange. We've built this tool very much through a bottom-up process, working with our own network of 11 and innovation hubs. But ideally, we're also building a tool that has broad relevance and applicability. So we, we're very keen to hear whether uh, some of this work can translate to additional context, or and if it doesn't, why not? Uh, yeah, so that's all for me. I just wanted to say thank you, and you can feel free to reach out to me by my email address, but I'm also working on this closely with Marie-Hélène and Adrien, so if these are already your points of contact, you can also feel free to, to reach out to us through them. So thanks very much. Thank you, Cecilia, for this. And I think that uh, uh, Marie-Hélène hasn't managed to come back yet, but she's working on it. So maybe we can uh, jump to the next opportunity that we saw as a connection for you. Of course, uh, initiatives are already connected, but more for uh, the DNAE who are jumping, uh, uh, starting a collaboration here in the project. Marius, the floor is yours. Thanks a lot. I will just share my screen. All right. I hope you can see the presentation now. Yes, perfectly. Perfect. Yes. Okay, thanks, Adrien, for the introduction. So, yeah, I think uh, Cecilia gave a nice overview over the project in general, and um, I will talk more about a concrete sub uh, project, sub part of the project, that is um, the involvement of um, citizens and farmers and the DINAIs in a citizen science data collection. So for those of you that are not uh, super familiar with the concept of citizen science, citizen science uh, means to involve citizens, um, people that are not um, scientists, um, to help collect, mostly collect data, but it can also mean to help to develop uh, experiments, for example, to discuss ideas and maybe even to discuss results of uh, experiments and data collection. And here, we also have something planned with an agroecology transect. As you all know, we are looking at biodiversity indicators and we want to collect data on those biodiversity indicators on your farms and on fields. For example, it is interesting to answer a specific question in terms of agroecology practices. For example, are certain landscape features 
affecting biodiversity? Uh, is it a difference if I look in the middle of a field or at the edge of a field? But since this is um, a citizen science um, part of the project, we are also interested in your questions. For example, you, you know the best in your local regional context, um, what is what is the practice there, how the fields look like. And so for us, of course, it is interesting to have your feedback and what would be interesting for you to look at. So you can always come to us. I will also post my email address in the chat after this talk. And this is always also a good way to, to connect and get in touch and to to get information about the project and about agroecology to the people. So I am working for the UFZ here in Leipzig and we are in touch with the persons of each um, innovation hub and the persons from the innovation hubs themselves are in contact with the networks associated with the innovation hubs, with villages, with local people and this connection we would like to use to get in touch with people that are living um, nearby the innovation hubs and are part of the communities and networks. So this means in the case of butterflies, for example, we have a protocol that we developed. And with this protocol, people can make 15 minute counts or transact walks and count butterflies. Here you can see a map where there are already butterflies counted by citizens. And that is really super easy and it makes fun. And we already did this since four years with citizens here in Leipzig. And it is a great success. And we were able to collect a lot of data on the butterflies here in the city. And there's also an app for your um, smartphone that you can use. And with this app, it is really easy to start a count. And it also helps you to identify butterflies with a picture. But also, for example, if you say you are interested, but oh, I have no time and uh, maybe I have, don't have enough knowledge. There are many different ways how you can participate and also engage other people. For example, we can also give you um, signs like these. And if you are in touch with the farmer and there's, for example, a nice hiking path going along a field, then you could maybe put a sign there and people that walk by can count butterflies near the farm and so by that, we can also gather information on the surroundings of a farm. Or you can get, get in touch with a farmer and the farmer asks a person if they want to count maybe on, on a field. Of course, for that, we need a permission and get in touch with a farmer. And we don't want people running around on fields randomly. And there are also other biodiversity indicators that we want to look at, for example, earthworms, or we also have those climate loggers and we look at um, soil temperature and moisture. And also birds are an idea or plants. And whatever is the best for you and interests you, <clears throat> you can participate. And as Cecilia already said, we can help you with training, with material and yeah, we are interested in your view. So thanks for your attention and yeah, you can contact me. No, Marie Marielle is yes. present now. I'm back, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I'm sorry for the technical issue. We don't really understand, but now we can move on. Thank you very much, uh, Cecilia and Marius. Uh, please feel free to put your email addresses in the chat. Uh, I think it will be easier if someone is interested to contact you. 
And uh, yes, I will uh, go back to where I stopped <laughs> and share my screen again. Um, okay. So if you remember well, uh, before I had this technical issue and before Marius and Cecilia talked, uh, we just finished uh, an activity um, which uh, allowed you to discuss and to share experience. And we organized this because we think that this is something really valuable for you. And this is also feedback that we received from the people who filled the survey. And we think that we can go a little bit further um, to help you network, to help you have more visibility also uh, in the world of the agroecological initiatives. And what we would like to suggest is to use the online dashboard that I showed you at the beginning of the webinar, uh, because as you saw, there is this map of all the initiatives uh, who answered, but you are anonymous on this map. So no one can know who you are and uh, people have no information on your initiative. And it is possible for us to add this information, for example, the name of your initiative, your country, the regions where the, the region, sorry, where you are active, also a short description based on some of your characteristics, and contact details also if you wish, such as your email address, a link to your website or to a social media page. So whatever uh, you think is valuable for people to find you, contact you, and for your initiative to be visible. But of course, uh, when you fill the survey, it was for something anonymous. So if you want your information to be displayed on this map, we need your consent. And so we, we just created a small form. This is something that takes a few seconds or one minute uh, to give your consent. And if you fill this form, uh, then in the future, we will be able to add all this information that will allow to give visibility to your initiative. I will also send uh, the link to this form in the chat. Um, oh, sorry. And um, initiative or a scientist. So the session has been recorded, so we will share the record uh, with you. Uh, I really hope it was interesting and useful. And of course, I think you all have our email addresses now. Feel free to contact us, give us feedback or whatever. And we really hope we will be able to continue to, to collaborate and build uh, knowledge together. So thank you very much. Um, does anyone else want to say something before we finish? Yes, maybe just as Walter mentioned in the chat, thank you to Emma for his uh, translation as a, a student who did that to practice. So thank you for that. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. And special thanks to Anna and Mikael and uh, Lucas left that who attended uh, this workshop. It was really useful to have you and we hope we can still uh, keep in touch during the next step of a project. It's very uh, valuable for us to have you. Okay. So thank you very much uh, for people who have the chance to have lunch now. Uh, have a good lunch. And uh, for the rest of you, have a very, very nice week. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you for bye. organizing. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. bye. Thank you, Marie-Hélène. Bye. Bye. Thanks.